So I'm Suzanne Wons. I'm the executive director of the Law School Library, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to today's book discussion on Professor, Con <laughs> Professor Cass Sunstein's latest book, Choosing Not to Choose, Understanding the Value of Choice. And uh, today on the panel with Professor Sunstein, we have Professor David Labson, the Robert I. Goldman Professor of Economics at Harvard University, Professor Mark Tushnet, the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, and the author of the book, Cass Sunstein, the Robert Walmsley University Professor of Harvard Law School. And today's proceedings are being taped, uh, so if we have time for questions at the end, if you ask a question, that will be part of the recording as well. Uh, and without further ado, I'll hand it over to our author. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, Charles Dickens, when he was uh, kind of toward the end of his life, uh, was frequently asked, what's his favorite book? And I hope I have a lot coming. But uh, Dickens wrote, uh, every parent in his heart of hearts has a favorite child. And his name is David Copperfield. <laughs> I find that very moving. Uh, this is currently my favorite child, I confess. It's no David Copperfield, but it's my favorite child. OK, so uh, with respect to medical choices, doctors often observe that patients don't want to choose. They want to be guided by someone who has expertise. If you've ever been in a taxi cab and the cab driver has asked you the horrific question, which route would you like me to take? <laughs> and you regard that as a horrific question, that's a uh, like how patients feel often with doctors. For retirement plans and health care plans, uh, many consumers uh, would like not to choose. Not all. They'd like the option of choosing, but not to choose. Uh, for energy providers, I got a note in my apartment saying, which one would you like? I wish they defaulted me into something good. And we're going to see some data from Harvard and elsewhere about shopping decisions. OK, so the problem is people often choose not to choose. That can be fully rational. It can be more rational than actually choosing, given the risk of overconfidence on the part of choosers and unrealistic optimism on the part of choosers. Uh, we may overrate autonomy, understood as choice making, on the ground that people have limited bandwidth. It is a form of paternalism to override people's choices, including the choice not to choose. So if there's any one-liner, that's the one-liner uh, that I'm presenting now. Uh, this book, I should note parenthetically, is in part responsive to a tremendous set of objections to uh, the book Dick Thaler and I wrote called Nudge. A guy named Rebenato uh, urges that people ought to be actively choosing all the time. And he argues this very powerfully. Uh, the kind of two quoque argument, meaning you too, to Rebenato and those who are persuaded by him, is that if you're overriding people's choice not to choose, then you're acting paternalistically. OK, so impersonal default rules, meaning a default which uh, allows people easily to choose not to choose. If they do nothing, they're not going to be making a choice, uh, is better than active choosing. So we have two players. They're in competition. They're having a kind of horse race here. Active choosing. You can see John Stuart Mill is the active chooser. And uh, the default rule person, maybe that's Professor Labson. He's written a lot about that. They're racing. And here's where Labson's ahead of Mill. Uh, the context is confusing and unfamiliar. People would prefer not to choose. Learning isn't especially important. And the population isn't heterogeneous along any dimension. So the claim is, those are the contexts where we want an impersonal default rule, and we don't want to compel active choices. Okay, those are the conditions. Second claim is that Mill starts winning the race when choice architects are biased or lack important information. The context is familiar. People would actually prefer to choose, and hence choice is a benefit rather than a cost. Learning matters, and there's relevant heterogeneity. I should say I'm involved right now in the middle of an empirical project 
which is finding that people would prefer, at least in certain contexts, to choose rather than not to choose, even in circumstances in which they have good reason to believe that they're inferior choosers. Which, now, they wouldn't pay an infinite amount to reserve the opportunity to choice in the, choose in those circumstances, but they pay something, which suggests that there are contexts in which people would choose, not to, would choose to choose, not only because they are um, confident, but also because they like choice as such. OK, so that's the second claim. Uh, personalized default rules, which means a default rule particular to you, where you're going to be defaulted into something that suits you, is better than impersonal ones in the face of relevant heterogeneity. If you have a good travel website uh, or a good retirement provider at the, when the time comes, uh, you're going to have a degree of personalization. They'll know what your seating preferences are. They'll know what your credit card is. They might know what your age is with respect to retirement, and then you'll be defaulted accordingly. Okay, fourth claim is personalized default rules have big advantages over active choosing because they produce benefits in terms of accuracy without requiring people to devote time and effort to choosing. So if choice architects are informed and trustworthy, we should give careful consideration to personalized defaults. OK, so uh, paternalism, let's just understand it as uh, a nanny who is uh, steering people in a direction that, in the view of the nanny, if the nanny is a good nanny, uh, is in the interest of the chooser. And we might think on welfare on autonomy grounds, there's a big problem with nannyism which is that it's an insult to people's autonomy and it threatens their welfare in circumstances in which they know best. Now I want to just bracket the question, how often do people know best? And just notice that if people are being required to choose in circumstances in which they don't want that, then the autonomy and welfare objections to paternalism completely kick in. Now that's a little bit of a awkward sentence. But the claim is, in circumstances in which people prefer not to choose, that's their choice, to require them to do so infringes on their autonomy and threatens their welfare on the same assumptions that justify an objection to paternalism in general. Yes? OK. Uh, here's a Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, uh, the savage who's surrounded by a world of comfortable default says, I don't want comfort, I want God, I want poetry, real danger, freedom, goodness, sin. We can see that as a kind of creed de corps on behalf of active choosing, even in circumstances in which maybe individuals don't want to exercise that form of liberty. OK, let's uh, now make, kind of contrary to my interest, an argument on behalf of active choosing. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the operation of the book. When I started the book, the, the goal in this you know, seemingly narrow topic was to vindicate the human practice of choosing not to choose, to say it's pervasive, it's honorable, it deserves presumptive respect. And in circumstances in which whether you're wealthy or poor in the middle, you kind of got a lot of things to worry about. To honor the choice not to choose is um, very good on welfare on autonomy grounds. But as the book got written, Mill's uh, insistence on active liberty, it kind of started out like a very few pixels, like on the Mac Air. And then it started looking like the new retina, it started looking bolder and bolder and clearer and firmer. And so uh, the book is much more ambivalent about the uh, default rule regime than I originally hoped it would be. And this is where the ambivalence lies. In circumstances in which learning is really important, in circumstances in which the choice architects are either confused or self-interested, in circumstances where people's values and preferences change over time, and in circumstances where people suffer from inertia or have diverse situations, then active choosing looks quite good. So Mill urged that we should see choice making as a muscle that grows stronger through its exercise. And there are circumstances where that's really important and true. 
And that's an argument for um, choice making and for a little nervousness about respecting or presuming in favor of choosing not to choose. But let's just notice that there are a few problems with uh, Mill's, what I'm describing as Mill's argument. It imposes a big burden on choosers who have to make choices in circumstances in which they don't want to. So a little anecdote, there was a human being in New York, looks a lot like me, might have been me, who received in the mail a notice under your uh, deal with the electricity company, you can uh, have green energy if you want. It's better in environmental terms. It costs nothing more, and it's same quality. Do you want green energy? Here's a little postcard. Mail it in. I was very happy to receive that. That sounded good. Guess whether I mailed the postcard in. Guess whether I can find the postcard. <laughs> it's not very hard to fill out a postcard with a check mark. But in many circumstances, and even then, my prediction is a large number of people in New York just didn't do anything with the postcard, even though they said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And that's just a little story about the burdens on choosers, the decision costs of active choosing. There's also a burden on planners. So if you think about healthcare plans or retirement plans or purchases of products, the decision costs are often very high for planners if they're to re design a regime of active choosing. That may not be a decisive objection, but it's a problem. There can be errors in terms of uh, chooser behavior, as we're observing in the case of healthcare plans, where people are making a lot of mistakes. So on the error cost front, we may not do uh, very well. Patients, there's a lot of data suggesting they don't really want uh, as much autonomy as they're getting. They regard that, especially under circumstances of stress, as an assault rather than a grant of something. And if people show bias blind spots, thinking you're biased, but I'm not, as the data tends to suggest, then there's also a welfare problem. OK, so the test would be one of cost of decision and cost of errors. I think that's the, the economic analysis of law has had many good ideas. It's only had one great idea. You're looking at it. When you get stuck, think about the cost of decisions and costs of errors. OK, now I'm just going to tell you about a little survey that I did nationally and at Harvard. Suppose there's an algorithm that tells you with high degree reliability uh, what books you're going to buy. Amazon, let's suppose, really knows what books you're going to buy. And so the question is, uh, do you like the idea of, of enrolling in a program in which it just sends books to you and you get them? You can send them back. 41% of people said yes, 59% said no. That predictive shopping result is interesting. Most people want to make their own changes, but a lot of choices, but a lot of people are going to sign up. Okay, here's automatic enrollment. What if a seller automatically and without your consent enrolls you in, the, in a program? Now this, I think, sounds a little bit um, slightly trivial, the Amazon example. But if it's useful, it's useful because it could potentially applies in an extraordinary range of domains in which a private or public institution knows with high probability what you want. And it could ask you, do you want just to run the machinery? Or it could ask you, or it could refuse to do that and just allow you to opt out. Okay, 29% say they would approve, and 71% said they would disapprove. That's interesting. Almost a third are in favor of automatic enrollment. It does suggest that people are happier with a sign-up opportunity without automatic opt-in, but a lot of people like automaticity. Okay, routine purchases. What about a system in which your, your home automatically gets stuff, like toilet paper, toothpaste? Um, you can send them back. What do you think of that? 32% uh, approved, 68% would not. That surprised me a little bit. I expected higher approval rates. I expect that to increase over time. Are Harvard students different? Big time. <laughs> Harvard students, almost three quarters, 
like predictive shopping for household goods is that they are busy, trusting, really bored by shopping. I'd like to think it's a youth effect. I'd like to think that people are getting used to this. I don't, I don't have that data, but that's my, that, I'd like that. OK, so we have a little framework, decision costs and error costs. Uh, scarcity and bandwidth in the head are important motivators. Choosing not to choose can be four things. We need an acronym. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they are. Uh, what's the most precious commodity that members of the human species have? Time. What's the one thing, and this is, if you remember anything, I hope it's this from these remarks. What's the one thing that public officials, lawyers, and doctors most often neglect? It's a pervasive failure, and it isn't love. <laughs> That's it. Thanks. Should I go first? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. So I'm a behavioral economist, and um, it, what a pleasure it is to read Cass's work, which I've uh, been inspired by for many, many years now. Um, and what a challenge it is to discuss this book, because essentially I agree with everything in it. Um, mm -hmm. The book is about three types of policy, three types of choice architecture, um, defaults, which um, I've done a lot of work on and certainly agree are terrific, uh, active choice, uh, which I also think is terrific, um, and mandates, which is the only area where there's light between our opinions. Mandates didn't make it into this talk, essentially uh, the book is about active choice and defaults. Mandates are the final chapter, and mandates are largely dismissed as an undesirable, not universally undesirable, but often undesirable policy. So Cass wants paternalism to be libertarian. He acknowledges a role for something stronger than that, uh, mandates, what he calls coercion. Um, and of course, as an economist, I'm not thrilled with coercion either. I mean, our entire orientation is towards choice, is empowering the agency of the individual to choose for themselves because they know best. And you know, we can rehearse familiar now arguments about why choice is terrific. People know more than the planner knows. Um, the planner is corrupt. The planner is wrong. There's so many good reasons that Hayek and others and Friedman have taught us um, to elevate choice choice either in the context of a default or choice in the context of active choice. In both of those domains, it's up ultimately to the individual to make their decision. Um, but I do think there's a role for mandates. And as a behavioral economist who studies the mistakes that people make, I think there's a bigger role for mandates than Cass allows uh, in this book. Um, chapter 8, as I said, is called coercion. Now, if you had to pick a name for <laughs> For uh, Social Security, for example, uh, I wouldn't pick coercion. Um, of course, it is coercive. Of course, it is a mandate. Uh, but there's a lot of policies that are coercive that our society embraces. Um, he concludes that what he calls mandatory pension plans, quote, cannot be ruled out in principle, but there are good reasons for considerable caution. Again, content from chapter 8. Now, he goes through arguments that I think won't surprise you um, for why we may be cautious regarding these kinds of uh, strongly paternalistic policies. The government right, might be wrong. But of course, the government might be wrong about planning for retirement. And we now know that consumers are <laughs> quite wrong about planning for retirement. The level of financial literacy is appallingly low. There's lots of reasons that they have self-control problems and other challenges that prevent them from making the right choices. So, the wrongness of the government strikes me as, um, on balance, less of an argument against paternalism um, than the wrongness of consumers is an argument in favor of paternalism in this context. There's secondly the issue of consumer heterogeneity. Uh, we don't want a one-size-fits-all 
savings rate for the American public. Well, that's right, but paternalism is not a one-size-fits-all savings rate for the American public. Paternalism is a floor uh, in this country. What we do is require people to save a certain amount, Social Security, and then you are free to flex up from that. And many of us do, and sadly, many of us don't. So um, we end up in a world where people can express their individuality above that floor. So I don't think that we're requiring a one-size-fits-all solution. We're just creating a floor um, and variation above it. The third argument is that savings and investment decisions are complex. Um, but of course, all that complexity is why we're trying to find a planner, an agent, to come in and help us out. Now, one might argue, well, let the consumer find their own planner, their own agent. But we know that that market is deeply broken. I mean, Cass, among others, has studied the problem that um, the world is full of people offering their services as financial planners, almost all of whom um, are offering corrupt advice. And the consumer is in no position to pull apart the 1% of advisors who are saying the right thing from the 99% who are recommending active funds with 100 basis points and fees. Um, Cass concludes from these arguments, quote, the fact of heterogeneity and the risk of government error argue strongly in the direction of defaults. But that's not at all where I end up when I look at this domain where paternalism plays, strong paternalism plays such an important role. Now, this is just one example. Throughout the book, the tone is generally very critical of mandates. Again, they're not ruled out, but they are um, essentially the very sad and, um, um, you know, unpopular cousin of defaults and active choice. Um, but you know, our policies are rife with mandates, uh, many of which, most of which I endorse. And I guess Cass would endorse too, uh, bans on unprescribed opiates. Should that really be a default or should that be a ban? Um, for savings, we've, we've already discussed. It would be bizarre if this room, if Cass, we're going to take a stand against Social Security, though that seems to be the message in Chapter 8. Um, taxes on cigarettes. That is not a nudge. That is not choice preserving. That is telling you, you want to smoke a cigarette? You have to pay four times um, the price of manufacturing the cigarette. I approve of that tax. Um, and I think it's a great thing that our society is suppressing cigarette smoking with these taxes. Um, and that is strong paternalism. I think the fundamental problem for me is that Cass is in sync with part of Mill's agenda. Um, there's a part of Mill that I'm going to come back to in a second, um, which is different, but there's a part of Mill's agenda which is that, uh, quote, the ordinary, and this is now Cass quoting Mill um, approvingly, the ordinary man or woman has means of knowledge immeasurably surpassing those that can be possessed by anyone else. Um, of course, this quote is half true. Um, in some domains, my private knowledge is immeasurably greater than the government's knowledge of my behavior. No one knows that I listen to Jimi Hendrix almost every day, um, but now you do. I wouldn't say this in the economics department, of course, so don't tell my friends over there. Um, uh, uh, but there are other domains where the government knows vastly more than I know. Um, for example, are synthetic, ca synthetic cathinones uh, an effective drug for heart disease? Who knows? None of us, of course. Um, they turn out to be an addictive uh, bath salt. Um, so, you know, the government has enormous advantages, maybe not in the era of Mill, but certainly in the modern era, um, in terms of regulating and organizing my life in ways that are, in fact, strongly paternalistic. But that's not even the half of it. Really, the more critical issue is domains in which I have a self-control problem and even if I know what I should do, I don't do it. I know I should eat better. I know I should exercise more. Um, I know I should save more. The American public is rife with good intentions and bad follow through. And so even if we've got all the information, in many cases, we need someone who basically prevents us from acting against our own self-interest. Uh, so in Social Security is our example of that. In other countries like Australia, they require you to put about 10% of your paycheck into a defined contribution account, and that money is locked up until you retire. Now, America, the US, stands as an outlier in the world in terms of our kind of resistance to these paternalistic policies. We have Social Security, but it's not a terribly generous program. Uh, and then we have 401ks, and they leak like a sieve. 40% uh, of the money that goes into 401ks comes out decades before retirement. 
Um, people are basically withdrawing the money, paying the penalty, spending it prematurely. Uh, now that has pros and cons. We've actually been anal analyzing that, and my co-authors and I, and there's good and bad to that. I don't want to suggest we shouldn't necessarily give people some liquidity, um, but we are far more flexible than every other developed country in terms of allowing people to pre-consume their retirement saving. Um, there's also lots of coercions that bubble up in the private sector, which I think we approve, um, approve of, like old school defined benefit plans, required saving, um, your employer takes money, puts it away, and then you get that when you retire, you can't touch it beforehand in the private sector. And then there's the new school defined contribution plans with employer non-contingent contributions. Anyone know a local employer that compels their employees to save 10 to 15% of their income, depending upon whether their income is below the Social Security cap or above the Social Security cap? And you can think of a local employer that does that? <laughs> <laughs> it's us. <laughs> Harvard has a coercive savings program. Um, I think you all know about it. Uh, I hope you all know about it. <laughs> this is maybe another information asymmetry. <laughs> Apparently, you don't know about your own benefits. I know you're not all Harvard faculty, but there are some in the room, I think. At least two that I can think of. Um, so Harvard basically has a, has a non-optional forced savings plan for its faculty. 10% of your income goes into a forced savings, a, a kind of illiquid savings account if you earn less than the Social Security cap, and then for every dollar above the cap, 15% goes into uh, this savings plan. And that's for workers over age 40. It's different slightly for people under age 40. Um, is it suboptimal for Harvard to engage in this coercion? Um, or is this good and quite clearly strong paternalism of the sort that um, Cass is discouraging uh, throughout the book, especially in chapter eight? In a recent paper that my co-authors and I are completing, we actually solve for the optimal saving scheme in a world where people have self-control problems and present bias using a utilitarian framework, a la Mill. So this is the mill that I love, not the mill that said liberty is all that matters, but the mill that said um, utilitarianism is the approach to, um, to policy. And in that paper, we derive an optimal, we find that the optimal savings scheme looks a lot like the US system, where you have some forced savings. In fact, we find that it's more than the US has, and then some additional kind of voluntary savings that can be, that can be spent before retirement with a penalty. Um, so that's the mill that I want to elevate, the utilitarian mill that says, let's maximize um, well-being. Um, and if that requires, um, uh, a policy that helps people overcome a self-control problem, so be it. So to summarize, um, you know, I love this book. This book is, is essentially 100%, you know, I'm, I'm convinced of all the arguments except the um, kind of criticism, the negativity directed at mandates. Um, I picture Cass holding the paternalism door open a crack. So what gets in that crack? Clearly libertarian paternalism. Um, Active choice gets in the crack, and I think that's in the libertarian paternalism domain. Um, and you know, he allows the possibility that some strongly paternalistic policies might also get through. But I think the proof that the door is being held too firmly shut without enough paternalistic policies making it through is that Cass seems to be saying um, that things like Social Security, defined benefit pension plans, even Harvard's defined contribution required, you know, th their contribution to our, um, to our retirement accounts, which is not optional, which is a coercive policy, uh, is not a good idea. Presumably, he'd like everyone to be able to opt out of these things, and I think that's the one place he goes, goes in the wrong step. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm going to, again, I think this is a, a terrific book as a part of a series of extremely provocative contributions. And I'm mostly going to talk about sort of where the next kinds of things to worry about should be. Um, and most of what I'm going to say is stuff that uh, Cass has heard before, not from me, 
but from it's now part of the discourse about uh, his approach to things. I do want to say one thing about the book survey, the, uh, the predictive uh, thing about books. So I would say no, uh, because uh, for, for me, it's not just the content of the book that I am worried about, but when I get it. So I don't want this thing to be like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Every month I get one of the damn things, and I, you know, they just add up because I don't have time to read them. Uh, so, so if there was some way of, yeah. if Amazon could, <laughs> there we so go. that's that actually is what's di different from your formulation of the household goods things because you had there the it was monitored so that when I ran out, the stuff would come in. And, and that'd be fine with me, you know, if they could, you know, if these things were delivered on Kindle and they know when I finish reading it, then maybe it would, I'd be in favor of it. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so here my, my general comments are that the, the book is written from, uh, and much of Cass's work is written from the perspective of what for these purposes I'll call the choice architects, both public and private. <clears throat> And it's a standard observation uh, that uh, these choice architects are subject to the same kinds of cognitive problems that consumers are. Uh, I think this is, falls under the heading of the confused choice architect in, in cases. Um, and there were just, there, there were a few paragraphs in the book that referred to this problem. And uh, as I read them, I, they seemed to me to say, well, yes, these might be problems, but um, these the choice architects are subject to the discipline of the market and of politics, and so some of the hard edges of the problems might be sanded off by that kind of discipline. Um, one reaction I had to that was to uh, invoke the phrase that uh, uh, Cass's co-author Thaler uses in his book over the summer, uh, that's the invisible hand wave. Well, the market will take <laughs> care of it. Uh, um, and, and and as to uh, the, the market, again, just recent reading, um, Ackerloff and Schiller assert, they actually don't do it in the book that I read because it's written for general public, um, that there is, with respect to the market, a, uh, what they call a, a, a fishing equilibrium, uh, which means it'll be uh, that that the equilibrium will be uh, the exploitation of rather than the uh, correction for uh, um, consumer errors. Um, I think the re the reaction to that would be well, uh, if that occurs, that sort of behavior would be uh, a target for ordinary, non-traditional uh, forms of regulation, uh, mandates, uh, coercive regulation. You just can't do that. Um, and that would be subject to the standard uh, public choicey kinds of concerns about whether um, the, the designers of these things could actually design uh, well-targeted uh, interventions. I, I'm less sure about the uh, public choice uh, architects. And here I just had a couple of thoughts. This one is not probably not best described as confusion, uh, but maybe more mission, maybe more bias, but I'm not sure. It, it's an idea of, uh, I, I call it, when I, when I teach this rel related stuff, the, the issue of mission commitment. So the public uh, choice architect uh, finds it difficult to appreciate the uh, force of the statement uh, don't just do something, stand there. Um, uh, so in, in the example that I use, the, the, the easiest example to, to, to teach for my purposes is the example of how you design the uh, cafeteria line. Uh, but that's already assuming that you've decided to put in a cafeteria. Uh, so maybe the issue for the analysis, for the uh, the issue of concern here is, gee, why did they think of putting in a cafeteria rather than you know, using the space for something else and letting the people go out to lunch and go to the places they feel like you know, they can go to you know, healthy foods, uh, what is chopped, or, uh, or um, McDonald's or whatever. Um, but that's OK. Um, would that, how, is, how would that be 
constrained uh, uh, politically. Uh, and, and, and now my only thought here is that there's a, an issue of maybe rational ignorance on the part of, uh, of citizens that uh, we would, at some in standard terms, I think probably talk about as agency problems. I, I just don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm uncertain. I have some thoughts about the private choice architect stuff. I'm, I'm quite uncertain about the public choice. The, the public uh, choice architects. Um, the last thing I want to say is I think now uh, not this is not a recommendation for chaos, but for other people. I, I think now there are enough examples in the world of non-traditional forms of regulation, the nudges forms of regulation, that go beyond, uh, I, I would say, mere information provision. Um, that, that it would be nice to know how they're working uh, and see what their characteristics are, what, what, what they actually do, uh, whether they do what we hope that they will do, uh, wh where, what kinds of failures can we identify and what are the sources of those failures. Um, I think, again, this is not Cass's next book, but somebody should be doing that kind of stuff. Okay, that's great. I'm super grateful to David and Mark for uh, reading the book and for these comments. And uh, they put their finger, not surprisingly, but disappointingly on the weaknesses of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so on the, I'll, I'll take uh, first the empirical question. Um, we are getting now uh, uh, data on which nudges work and which don't. So the White House's Behavioral Insights team just released a few weeks ago its first annual report, and they describe a dozen or more interventions, and they show significant, not extraordinarily large, but significant beneficial effects from the strong majority of the interventions they tried. And to their credit, they report on the ones that had no impact. So that's great. The UK also has a very large data set on uh, which interventions have worked. Uh, something I'm working on now with a set of co-authors is a uh, effort to compare uh, nudge interventions with more standard uh, tools to see what the net benefits of the two look like. And uh, we're going to have a lot within the next six months on, on that sort of thing. Basically, the, the record of uh, most nudges is uh, very positive, somewhere between statistically significant and uh, extraordinary. So the coming data is, is, is upbeat. In terms of private choice architects and whether the market is a sufficient discipline on them, I think Mark's quite right that this is underanalyzed in the book. There's a kind of uh, uh, too quick suggestion that markets will be a correction against self-seeking and malevolent choice architects. In a way, that's true. If you have a car that has, uh, to use uh, David's, David's notion of shrouded attributes that uh, you can't quite see, they're not up front, they're not what you buy a car for, uh, the optimistic view is over a course of years that manufacturer isn't going to be very popular, that's, that's probably not right. So uh, a lot more needs to be done, mostly on the empirical side on that. The private choice architects who are self-serving. And the book, Fishing for Fools by Akerlof and Schiller, it has a, a tale uh, that is very negative about the operation of the invisible hand. And I describe it as a tale because I don't think the Negativity is quite earned, but there's, but it's a tremendous book. Okay, in terms of David's thoughts on paternalism, I, th I, th I think a little bit, as he was talking, I thought of William Blake, who has marginalia, the poet, artist, his marginalia on Sir Joshua Reynolds, where he says to generalize is to be an idiot, uh, to particularize is the alone distinction of true merit, I thank God I am not like Reynolds. I think I'm a little like Reynolds. 
And that's uh, that's meant as a as a confession of a kind of mistake in the in chapter eight. So uh, there's a paper by one of David's colleagues, uh, Ed Glazer, who's a tremendous economist, which actually takes off against libertarian paternalism, against default rules, et cetera, on um, kind of abstract a priori grounds, which are in a way the mirror image of my own argument against coercion. And my reaction to Glazer is it's too undifferentiated, operates at too high a level of abstraction to earn the result. So I think that is, that is fair. Uh, now, what would be a path forward? Uh, one suggestion and then a, a cautionary note. A uh, path forward on which there's a very, very uh, adolescent stage in this, meaning we're not in infancy, but we're not grown up in terms of the research, is on behavioral market failures, where if we can identify a specific reason why individual choices will systematically blunder, maybe it's present bias in the case of Social Security, maybe it's addiction in the case of cigarette purchases, uh, maybe with shrouded attributes in the context of fuel economy choices, these are all maybes, uh, then we can supplement our standard catalog of market failures and have behavioral market failures which stand uh, on as solid a ground as a justification for intervention. It seems to me correct and extremely important. Uh, the book urges that in the case of behavioral market failures, the, preserve, the preferred result is a choice-preserving intervention. But uh, that seems like Reynolds, doesn't it? It's not clear that, that that's correct. So the, the cautionary note would be, of course, if we had an expert and well-motivated choice architect, then on welfare grounds in the face of a behavioral market failure, a mandate would be justified on welfare grounds. That's kind of self-evidently correct. I think the unexciting cautionary note is if you are nervous about the um, lack of information or the biases of the choice architect, you might think of a choice-preserving approach as having a safety valve. And that, in the end, if the kind of uh, too quick argument of chapter eight is right, it's probably for some reason like that. But uh, what I've just done, I think, is not invisible hand waving, but I've waved some kind of flag, kind of the University of Chicago flag. I think I've waved, and that's that. That will not sustain a full argument. So, questions, comments. The default is you have to ask a question. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I have a question about this question that's on the screen, the sort of Amazon books uh, survey. I wondered um, how much people were responding out of kind of slightly creepy privacy fears rather than anything else. It's, 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 I would probably say no, not because I don't think Amazon would choose good books for me, but because I think they would choose really good books and I'd be really slightly freaked out about how well they know me and, and how much they've been tracking my preferences. I don't know if that's something that sort of interests you at all as a response to that question? It is interesting. And uh, undoubtedly, some of the respondents had some thought like that in mind. Uh, the question is whether that drives the answers. Uh, so I'll tell you what I think drives the answers, um, and though I don't have data. I think what drives the answers is thinking that uh, Amazon has its own economic interests at heart, and they're going to be sending you a lot of books. If we could. Uh, convince people that that's not a problem and overcome Mark's concern, which in principle we could, then the privacy issue, I doubt, motivates most of the negativity, especially because the principal privacy concern you might think is Amazon knows, uh, knows what books you like. They already know that. They're giving you suggestions, which you see visibly. And this would just be taking a subset of the suggestions and saying, we know with close to 100% probability you're going to buy that one. So if, if you feel creeped out to see they know because of what arrives in the mail, the question is whether it's rational to feel more creeped out by that than by looking on the screen and thinking, oh my god. <laughs> so I'm, sure, I'm sure some people are 
uh, reflecting that. And for personalized defaults, the privacy issue is, uh, is highly relevant. One question is whether the, per the, per the privacy issue could not be handled by a personalized default with respect to privacy. So they might know you care about your privacy, so we're going to not have a personalized default for you. Can I just add just an anecdote from the early days of this predictive stuff, which is there's a story in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which the title of which was Netflix thinks I'm a gay Nazi, uh, <laughs> because the the list was Das Boot and La Cage of Fall. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sir, yeah. Um, so, my question. Uh, thanks so much for coming and uh, talking. Um, so, I'm really curious about this default versus mandate issue, and I think about it especially in the education context. So, in other words, should we make it a default that every high school student? takes the SAT or the ACT before they graduate? Or should it be um, a mandate that you know, everybody takes this before they graduate so that they're you know, able to apply to college? Should it be a default that people um, are enrolled in a FAFSA class that supports them in filling out the FAFSA? Or should that be a mandate from the school district that you know, every kid has to take this class so that they're better prepared for applying to college? Okay. I don't know about the particular ones, but the framework should be about uh, welfare. So if it's the case that taking the SAT or the ACT uh, produces an increased probability of college attendance that's quite significant for people who in the end want that, that would be a strong point in favor. If it ends up just making people take a test they don't want and don't need, and uh, giving them a bad week, then that would be an argument against that. So probably depend on the particulars, and maybe we could build out from what is curricularly mandated for people in high school or grade school, and their, their justifications for that, that they have long-term benefits. Can I pick that? So, it's a great question. I haven't heard that proposal made, either to make it a default or a mandate, um, but there's so many complicated theoretical issues that come to mind as you pose that policy. I think we'll only know if someone does a randomized control trial, take a small sample, That's run 1,000 right. people through these different arms, and let's find out um, uh, whether, in fact, five years later we made them better off, this cohort, or whether we wasted a lot of people's time. I'll tell you, tell you one a great study that comes from someone at Harvard that's relevant to your question, which was uh, the ACT, just by kind of serendipity, I believe, gave people in the 1990s a chance to send not three but four free scores to colleges. Just by serendipity, they raised it from three to four. It was $6 to, to go to an additional one. The result of that tiny intervention was to increase quite significantly the percentage of poor people who were going to terrific colleges. It had no impact on people who medium and high income, but a significant impact. Who would have expected that? So that supports the randomized trial idea. The reason apparently was that poor people, once they had a, a fourth school they could send it to, took a flyer on, let's say, Princeton, and they got in. Thanks so much for your talk today. Um, I was just thinking about in terms of actually implementing, for example, default rules, um, how far um, political stability is important in order to make it a longer term thing than something that would maybe go back and forth as administrations change. So is there any correlation or how important is the factor of political stability, do you think, in actually making this stuff work? Um. Well, if what you have is learning over time, such that you shift from, let's say, a mass to personalized default, or you shift from a default to active choosing, or vice versa, because people learn, then that introduction of decreased stability is fine. 
Uh, to the extent that you have kind of Republicans do one thing and Democrats another, that might also be fine because elections have consequences. Uh, to the extent, and this is what I believe to be true, that the universe of default rules we're observing from government are not politically contentious, especially. For example, when I was in the Obama administration in 2009, I got a bunch of calls from Republicans saying, will you talk to us about automatic enrollment in, healthcare, in health insurance? That's what we want. Now, of course, I couldn't talk to them, but I was working for the president, but that's what they were enthusiastic about. So I, I think we're gonna see, with respect to the default rule enterprise, let's say, a great deal of stability over time. And if we don't, it might be okay. Yeah, hello there. Um, I was wondering, it, it, it's, it, I gather that uh, the unit of analysis is mainly individual natural persons in the studies that you refer to. So I'm just wondering how you interpret uh, your findings and your ideas for, um, for groups, organizations, companies, states, with regards to choice architecture and choosing not to choose. I think we'd have, at, at a certain level of generality, we'd have exactly the same analysis, wouldn't we? That whether, let's say, the government defaults corporations into one or another thing, or calls for active choosing, or whether it treats nonprofits via default or not, or whether a nonprofit dealing with uh, its um, donors, it would be exactly the same analysis. The wrinkle would be, and David probably has all the data on this, that for some of the entities you discussed, it may be a default rule is less likely to be sticky, that people are, are that procrastination, which is one reason that a default rule sticks, you might not observe that so much for someone who runs a large business. And if default rules stick because of the power of suggestion, which is one reason they do. It might be an individual thinks there's a, a, a good informational signal I'm getting from the default, and a nonprofit might think to itself, I kind of know, and that's not, that's not for me. I think we have time for about one more question, but before um, you go ahead, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that the coop is outside the door here selling books. Um, unfortunately, Professor Castine needs to go to class at one o'clock, but will be available in his office tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 10 for signing, correct? Uh, Maybe 9.30 to 10.30, how's that? <laughs> uh, you speak about ex ante preferences about choice, but some research indicates that ex post, sometimes people are happier if they didn't get choice to begin with. So even though I might think I want choice, and if you ask me now, I'll want it, but eventually I'll be happier with the results if I didn't have any choice to begin with. So maybe there's a difference about when you, ch when you check people's preferences about choice. Yes, so if people ex ante want to choose, then not, making, not allowing them produces a welfare loss if it's a context in which afterwards they're delighted that they didn't choose, it might be because they end up with something they know is better, or it might be because they save the time of choosing. And offhand, the numbers are gonna work out in a context like that, favorably to uh, either a default rule that doesn't involve active choosing or to a mandate. In other words, there'd have to be a very large and intense interim loss in the circumstance, you're, or the person's gonna have to die the moment after they're happy for the numbers to work out unfavorably. Time for one more. Well, let's, let's thank our panel. Uh.